Hello everybody, welcome to a brand new episode of Mega Projects. This one's all about the CN Tower. When I was a kid, the CN Tower was the tallest building in the world. I always wanted to go and see it. I've still never seen it. It's definitely on my list. And let's jump into it. One of the seven wonders of the modern world stares down regally over the city of Toronto. The 553.3 meter high CN Tower held the record for the tallest freestanding structure on Earth for 32 years until the Burj Khalifa soared skyward in 2007. But it remains a marvelous, iconic structure that has become Toronto's signature. Nobody would ever accuse the Canadians of being overly flashy. I mean, I'm sure there are flashy Canadians, but. You probably know what I mean. The CN Tower is not the most glittering obelisk that stands today. It looks perhaps a little odd, a little space agey, maybe even slightly dated now. And yet there is something strangely captivating about its sci fi appearance and the fact that one of the tallest freestanding structures in the world is essentially a giant TV and radio antenna. The story of the CN Tower begins in 1968, when Canadian National Railway proposed building a large TV and radio communication platform that could serve all of Toronto. But it wasn't until 1972 that the project was given the green light and plans got underway. Toronto in the 1970s saw an ever-changing landscape with numerous skyscrapers emerging. While this certainly looked impressive from afar, the reflective nature of the buildings began to cause issues for TV and radio signals in the city. Long before the internet, most data communications were done through point-to-point -point micro microwave links. You probably remember satellite dishes on the sides of buildings. It was decided that an antenna of at least 300 meters tall would be needed, and CN planned to rent a space in the tower for microwave links that would be visible from any point in the city and the surrounding area. The original plan for the tower was nothing like what we see today. The preliminary design called for a tripod shape with three independent cylindrical pillars which would all be linked together with various bridges. As the process evolved, this tripod was eventually abandoned, and the CN Tower took on the shape that we know today. Built by Canada Cement Company, the construction of the CN Tower got underway on the 6th of February 1972. As you might expect, with such a dizzying structure, the foundations were immense. Roughly 56,000 tons of earth and shale was removed during the excavations. That's equivalent to the weight of almost six Eiffel Towers. The base area, which took just four months to complete, was dug down to a depth of 15 meters and filled with 7,000 cubic meters of concrete, 450 tons of rebar, that's steel mesh, and 36 tons of steel cable. The way that the CN Tower rose into the sky was itself quite groundbreaking. A hydraulically raised slip form was built at the base which could be slowly lifted as the concrete below it set. This was a platform that was moved up by six meters each day to allow the work to go on beneath it. Concrete was added to the structure until the 22nd of February 1974, by which time it had already become the tallest structure in Canada. In total, the tower contains 40,500 cubic meters of concrete, enough to fill 16 Olympic-sized swimming pools, but making sure it was poured correctly and maintaining vertical accuracy called for a rather old-fashioned yet certainly tried and true method. Plum bobs may sound like an old-fashioned sweet, but they played a vital role in the construction of the CN Tower. These weights with pointed tips were designed to measure both vertical and horizontal levels before the days of spirit levels. The construction of the CN Tower involved giant plumb bobs attached to the slip form. As the whole structure was raised daily, the progress and accuracy was determined by the positioning of the plumb bobs, and they did a hell of a job. Overall, the tower varies from true vertical accuracy by just 29 millimeters, which is 1.1 inches. Construction on the main level area where the observation deck, restaurant, and broadcasting stations are began in August 1974, involving 45 hydraulic jacks attached to cables that had been attached to a temporary steel crown at the very top of the tower. Over one week, 12 giant steel and wooden bracket forms were slowly raised and formed the base of the main level. The observation deck, then known as the space deck, was built by pouring concrete into a wooden frame attached to rebar at the lower deck level. 
The final piece of the tower was, of course, the all-important antenna. The process of raising it piece by piece was underway using a crane when an unexpected option suddenly became available. The Sikorsky S-65 Skycrane is a twin-engined, heavy-lift helicopter produced by the United States Army. And as luck would have it, one was sold to a civilian operator at exactly the right moment. It was a stroke of fortune that would shave several months from the construction process. However, it so nearly began in tragic circumstances. The helicopter, named Olga, was first asked to remove the crane that was slowly winching sections of the antenna upwards. As Olga began removing the first pieces of the crane, the wire became twisted and got caught on some of the bolts. Olga was now effectively attached to the tower with no way of breaking free, and the crane operator was still inside his machine. Now, don't know much about helicopters, but I'm sure the last thing that a pilot wants is to be attached to a giant tower with only 50 minutes worth of fuel in the tank. It had all the makings of a Hollywood classic, and the script didn't disappoint. Steel workers on site rushed up the tower and successfully burnt off the bolts just in time. Olga and the crane sprang free from the CN Tower and landed with just 14 minutes of fuel remaining. After the near disastrous start, the rest of Olga's time around the tower sailed past smoothly as she transported the 44 sections of the antenna up to the peak. This site proved quite a stir and the helicopter's schedule was printed in local newspapers so that members of the public could come down and watch Olga in action. With her help, the antenna phase of the construction took only three and a half weeks instead of the planned six months. On the 2nd of April 1975, the CN Tower was completed, bringing its total weight to a monstrous 118,000 tons, while also surpassing the height of Moscow's Ostankino Tower. This was now the highest freestanding building in the world. The CN Tower had employed a workforce of 1,537 who worked in shifts 24 hours a day, five days a week, for a total of 40 months. It came in at a total cost of about 63 million Canadian dollars, which was about $270 million in 2018, which was repaid in just 15 years through antenna rental and ticket sales to its observation decks. The tower opened to the public on the 26th of June 1976. The opening ceremony included placing a small time capsule within the structure that is due to be opened in 2076, the tower's centenary year. It contains letters from Pierre Trudeau, the Prime Minister at the time, provincial premiers and school children from around Canada, as well as various newspapers and Canadian currency and various denominations. If you happen to watch our video on the Empire State Building, you might recall that the same thing was done there, but when it was opened, they found the contents had been destroyed as the capsule had been sealed properly. Let's hope that whoever was in charge of the capsule on the CN Tower did a better job. What we can see from outside certainly doesn't tell the whole story. The main part of the tower is a hollow concrete hexagonal pillar, which contains stairwells as well as power and plumbing connections. The three glass elevator shafts are located in the three inverted angles created by the tower's hexagonal shape, and each shaft accommodates two elevators. If you want to visit the CN Tower, you have three areas to admire the view. The glass floor and outside observation terrace at 342 meters, the indoor lookout level at 346 meters, and the sky pod, formerly the Base deck at 446.5 meters, just below the metal antenna, which itself stretches to 102 meters. The glass floor of the outdoor observation terrace incorporates an area of 24 square meters, and just in case you're a little squeamish about walking out onto glass 342 meters up, it can withstand pressure of 4,100 kilopascals. If, like me, those numbers mean absolutely nothing to you, that's roughly the weight of 35 moose. <laughs> making it five times stronger than the required strength for commercial spaces of this sort. So you'll probably be fine. The glass units used are composed of a pane of 25mm 1-inch laminated glass, 25mm airspace, and another pane of 13mm laminated glass. Below the public areas, located at a height of 338 meters, is a large donut-shaped redome, weatherproof enclosure, which contains all the CN Tower's UHF transmitters. The 360 restaurant is understandably one of the biggest attractions of the CN Tower, the revolving restaurant makes a full rotation every 72 minutes, and it's situated at 351 meters. In 1976, when the tower first opened, a disco named Sparkles, which may be both the best and worst name for a disco, could also be found where the indoor observation level currently is. Unsurprisingly, it was the highest disco and dance floor in the world. 
The tallest metal staircase on Earth climbs steadily from the base of the tower to the sky pot. That's 2,579 steps if you think you've got it in you, or 1,776 steps to the main deck level. However, the stairs are meant for emergency use only, and they're not open to the public. However, there are some exceptions to that, and twice a year, the stairwell is opened for charity stair climb events. The fastest climb on record was in 1989 by Brendan Kinoy, an Ontario provincial police officer who barreled up in just 7 minutes and 52 seconds. The average time for the climb is 30 minutes. Now, If you're looking for a thrill quite like any other, then the CN Tower's Edge Walk might be for you. Opened in 2011, this experience allows daredevils to walk around the roof of the main pod directly above the 360 restaurant. Visitors are attached to a rail system system above them that can walk around the edge of the CN Tower on a 1.5-meter metal floor while being at a vertigo-inducing 356 meters in the air. It's the world's highest full-circle, hands-free walk, and, well, it looks pretty terrifying. There's two things the CN Tower is famous for. Let's start with lightning. Countless images show the mighty tower being struck by lightning, and it happens with unbelievable regularity, about 75 to 80 times per year. In August 2011, however, it was hit 52 times in just 84 minutes. But don't worry, it does remain a safe place even during a storm, as it channels its lightning strikes through long copper strips. When it's not being hit by lightning, it's also famous for its lighting. The CN Tower was initially installed with incandescent lights, but they were removed in 1997 for being inefficient and expensive. Since June 2007, the tower has been lit by 1,330 super bright LED lights inside the elevator shafts which move over the main pods and up to the top of the antenna. The color scheme changes for specific holidays, red and green for Christmas, yellow for Human Rights Day, red for Valentine's Day, and green for St. Patrick's Day, to name just a few. The estimated cost of the LEDs is $1,000 per month, but they're turned off during spring and autumn bird migration seasons in an attempt to lower bird mortality. The importance of the CN Tower to both Toronto and Canada can't be understated. Now in its 44th year, the tower remains a truly iconic monument that is visited by 1.5 million people every year. But what's really great about the CN Tower is just its unabashed practicality. This wasn't an ego trip or some fantastical design. Toronto needed a huge antenna tower, and that's what they built, and sure, it's got a few extras for excitement value. This is an extraordinary mega project that serves the most ordinary of purposes, and yet, like the Empire State Building or the Eiffel Tower, it's come to define its city. In 1995, it was included in the American Society of Civil Engineers' Seven Wonders of the Modern World, along with the Channel Tunnel, the Empire State Building, the Golden Gate Bridge, the Itaipu Dam, the Delta and Zuiderzee Works, and the Panama Canal. This humble yet monstrous communication tower has some awe-inspiring company, but it deserves its place with the greats and all of the recognition that it gets. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please do hit that like button below. Don't forget to subscribe. Also, if you've got suggestions for mega projects, definitely leave them in the comments below. Most of these ideas I find from the most upvoted comments. So please do that, and thank you for watching.